Good morning everyone. Um, mine is as short as I am um, and it's just to welcome you. Uh, my name is Una Ramson Tate, um, Fundo and uh, today for us is a very exciting day. Uh, this is our very first numerous in Daba. We've kind of been waiting for it for a very long time. Uh, and really just saying to everyone, welcome and thank you to our speakers who have agreed to come and share their knowledge uh, with us and for those that have traveled afar. And of course, I see also some of our funders uh, that uh, are supporting our work without the support of um, FEMEF, AGTP, SA, Xenex, and as well as MSDF, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we're doing. Uh, just a bit of a context around um, numeracy and Balawande in Funawande. So we started um, in 2018, implementing 2019, in Eastern Cape with literacy. And as the learning organization that we are, so we often say we're not here uh, you know, to do the scale personally. We see ourselves as a learning lab. We see ourselves as an experimenting ground. Uh, and we want to respond to the needs on the ground. So when we initially started off with literacy, the teachers in our 30 schools came back and said, yeah, this literacy thing is great, but we're also struggling with maths. Um, and continuously getting that feedback from the ground, um, and then we made the decision um, that we will uh, uh, pilot a, a numeracy intervention and foundation phase, um, led by, by, by Ingrid and the, you know, uh, uh, also management of my colleague, uh, Perme, who's the head of content. So I promised you that mine is as short as I am, and ready to say thank you. We're looking forward to, uh, to the discussions, and again, as a learning organization, um, you know, we, we value these types of discourses uh, and we try as much as possible to bring that into our work. So, all the best with uh, today's conversations and that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Molweni? Hi. Oh, yeah. Okay, so my name is Nompomela Lopemi Isaac and as Munang Amso said, I am the head of content and training at at Fundawande. Um, and I just want to first announce one thing. Um, it says on the program that Mamu Khedi will be talking after Unangamso, but um, she will join us later at 10.30. So what we're going to be having now is calling um, the speakers for the foundation phase maths materials. And the, the, the reason why we have this session is because there's been a lot of work done by NGOs out there and there's a lot of materials that they've developed um, and part of it is actually sharing lessons and letting us know about what is available. So if Anno, Nikki and Lindy well, could come up on the stage and share their presentations with us. Good morning colleagues. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to be making this presentation together with my colleague Nikki and it's focusing on um, the development of learning and teaching resource materials in, sorry, from grade R up to grade six. Now, this um, research draws from different um, projects that have been taking place from um, university-led projects, from non-governmental organization-led projects, as well from um, some of the research hubs and the government as well. And I'm going to basically give you the, the methodology that we used, and um, Nikki is going to provide you with the findings and the recommendations. Now, we started with an in-depth analysis, and the in-depth analysis was basically um, a documentary review of work that has been done. We looked at different reports that have been provided. Um, we looked at evaluation reports that have been done on the material that has been produced. Some of them were external evaluations, some of them were internal evaluations, as we may know. Um, we do get LTSM developers getting the work being evaluated by themselves or independently. And there were specific features that we were looking at um, for this part of the investigation. We looked at issues like cost effectiveness, distribution of the materials, whether there's any teacher support involved, um, et cetera, because we wanted to look at whatever that is being produced. Um, is it quality material? 
and does it have potential to be to be maybe improved to make sure that it can be taken at, at national scale. We focused on six LTSM projects, the DBE workbooks, the TMU pilot framework, and the rest, as you can see. So the in-depth analysis actually focused on those six. Now, after the in-depth analysis, we investigated further. We conducted what we called <coughs> a deep dive analysis. Um, now, we specifically picked three out of the six that I, m I mentioned earlier, and we looked at multiplicative reasoning in these three. So there's a process that we followed. Um, we actually pulled them and checked the representations. Uh, we looked at the progression, progression in number, progression in um, concepts, if there were any connections made, if there were the structure of the LTSMs. And then we actually developed a framework that we used to, to, to test this. And um, out of the six, as I mentioned, we came up with three that we focused on this being the DBE workbooks, the TMU, as well as number sense. Now, this is the framework that we used. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but as you can see, we're checking um, what is the concept development in the ELTSM. Are there any pictures used? If they are there, are they making any sense? Are there any connections between the words that are there and the pictures that are used and the worked examples, if any? Um, a lot of work has been done. We've got to admit, there's a lot of work that has been done in the development, but maybe when we talk about the recommendations that we'll look at, are there any gaps that are still existing? Um, I'll mainly focus on what we found to be very helpful for each one of these LTSMs. Um, the first one being the DB workbooks. So we found that there are a lot of pictures that are there in the DBA workbooks, but maybe they are not giving us the information that we would like to get. They are not assisting the learner to actually understand the mathematical concepts. So them being the, um, what is their function if they're not getting us to the end, to the outcome that we desire. Um, regarding the mathematical register, not highlighted, um, and we need maybe text boxes, um, but also because these are workbooks, we also need to try to find the balance. Um, how much of these do we need to to pull in and still remain with a, a text that is not text heavy, a workbook that is not text heavy. Bare calculations not present, um, coherence, actions, they are there, but they are limited. Number range is present, but we totally missed um, conception, um, concept progression. Worked examples, they were not there, but maybe this is the structure that they followed when they were developing this. Um, the second one that we looked at is the TMU and using the same, excuse me, criteria of representation, coherence, progression, and worked examples, we found that the TMU, on the other hand, actually has, uses a lot of pictures. Um, and I might have um, forgotten to actually share this with you. When we're looking at, at the multiplicative reasoning, we're specifically looking at how division by sharing and division by um, um, grouping is treated in those books. So you find that some of the examples that I use are actually um, talking to that. Um, there were no bare calculations and um, there is some coherence. Uh, there's also progression in number range and also progression in, in, in concepts, um, concept progression. As you can see, the little picture that I have there um, is actually indicating how at the end of the book we've got assessments which are preparing the learner for the next part of the work. So that is a good thing. And we didn't find any worked examples. And maybe if you can check already from the two that I've presented, you see that there are some kind of similarities. There are some good things that we get from each, but there are some gaps. Um, let me apologize for the picture quality here, but this is for number sense. Um, when we're done with our final report, we are actually going to get better pictures. Um, what I would highlight here is the illustrations. There's use of illustrations, which is a good thing, and these illustrations are not just there. As you can see, we've got an illustration showing how sharing is being done. So in this case, it's not just a plain illustration, it's an illustration that is also giving the learner or guiding the learner to actually understand what they should be learning here. And mathematical vocabulary not highlighted. Um, 
bare calculations, some of them are there, some are not there, and um, number range is present, and concept range is not present. Also, we find that they, there are no worked examples here. Um, I'm going to hand over to Nikki on this point. Thanks, Lindive. Yeah. Uh, audible. Oh, yes, I am. Okay, so just to be clear, this is um, work commissioned by the Department of Basic Education um, and is in an effort to try and join up and uh, coordinate a whole range of things that are being done across the country. So choices were made in consultation with um, the DBE. There are several uh, documents. Obviously, CAPS is the obvious one, but also the TMU framework. And within the Department of Education, there are what are called e-education guidelines, which have got digital content and have a big overlap with LTSM guidelines. So the department has invested quite substantially in defining what do we mean by quality. Um, and I think one of the key things, because there are different theories of change that different organizations use. I know Arno will, will say, well, we've got to get the books into the children's hands and the children flying and moving it. There are others who say, well, actually, the teacher's at the center, and they need to be capacitated to support those learners and the ways in which that happens. So this is a theory of change from the whole Department of Basic Education. And you can see the centrality of the teacher which our biggest budget spend is on teachers. For us to be bypassing them is neglecting that huge resource. But I know that there's a tension because what they know and what they do is very difficult to shift. So there are a range of principles that have been developed in terms of looking at educational processes. Um, these are all defined in the documents that I just showed and are available. They come from the e-education um, unit. Things like responsive. Innovations are trialed at small scale, documented, lessons are shared, and then scaled. And I think it's really important to know that this is coming from the DBE. This is a DBE document saying what's needed in terms of innovation. Innovative, there is no one size fits all. Now this is a big tension because some people in the DBE and in the room consider the one child, one book, one country approach. But actually we know in South Africa that they're significantly different contextual frameworks and working with on the ground realities, contingencies and change management is integral to the use of ICT but also to the use of LTSM which can be ICT. So I've just tried to create a picture of what I see as the big tension, um, which we've experienced as we've gone through this process. You have the big ship of 18,000 mainstream schools with the idea of one message, simplicity of what's done, um, stability of curriculum, non-interference, let us get on with a single message, is a key piece. At the same time, you have these little yachts uh, design hubs, learning organizations, uh, universities, uh, projects funded by CSI that are trying to make a difference. But in the scale of 18,000 schools, they're working at most with the district or with 20 schools, and I'm arguing that they're necessary. But they're necessary in relation to having a plan a five-year plan and then a 10-year plan of knowing when renewal is happening. And this is something that the department have said back to us. We want to be able to not have a curriculum that's there for 100 years. At the same time, you don't want a curriculum that's chopping and changing. So we need to have in our medium-term expenditure framework, in our five-year plans, that there are ways in which the little yachts can inform the changes that get made, and then in terms of the DBE's own priorities, that there can be variation in relation to context. Um, so the main point here is for phased innovation and small-scale trialing, which fe feeds into key points in time where there's curriculum and LTSM innovation. So you have five years to make a change, 10 years to make more radical changes. So when we focus on quality standards, again, also published by the DBE, the orange section is really where we're looking at today, curriculum design, LTSM, the delivery, as well as assessment, and all of that gets packaged together. 
Those are documented. So this is in relation to distance learning in terms of a shift to COVID. I've learned from my work at Sadie, if you do distance learning well, you do face-to-face -face learning well too, because you get the added benefits of the humans. Um, so there are some really nice standards about, you know, what do we mean by good? Um, and these are then unpacked, and I'm not going to read them, but what it is that you expect LTSM to address. That's at the big picture of DBE. We now focus more specifically on what does this mean for mathematics in primary schools. And I think there are particular ways of thinking about things like progression, things like coverage, things like how do we know when children know and what do we do when they don't are really important pieces of maths LTSM. So I talk about the workbook or learner activity book plus. Because I think we'll see from Arno's books, it's a learner activity book that isn't expecting any mediation from a teacher. It's take the book and run and work with it at the right pace. The workbooks, DBE workbooks, were designed in the same way. Kind of, this is extra work, keep the kids busy, get some homework. But actually, we now know that they're so central to how mathematics happens in mainstream classrooms that we have to give the plus. And we also know that the plus, when it's fragmented with lesson plans, with concept guides, with video pieces that you can download, with little WhatsApp groups, it's really hard to coordinate. And so there are increasingly ways in which to build the instructional design, what's needed from the teacher, into the workbook. So we know the workbook is the thing that gets used. How do you make sure that the connections with the other pieces, if there are pieces, and the core messages are coming through the learner workbooks? We think, therefore, that there's a need for worked examples, that there's a need for more pedagogy around how do you approach this, as opposed to offering a whole range of examples which a child is left to solve, and that we think there needs to be pedagogical scaffolds. So what is it that you say as a teacher? What do you do? What do you draw? Conceptual threads is a concept that's come from um, Elspeth at the DBE, and to be looking at a few powerful representations that travel. If you look at the DBE workbooks, you'll see the number lines are all over the place. You've got empty number lines from grade one, as opposed to carefully using structured number lines, then going into structuring twos, fives, tens. Um, we need to use representations that travel, by which we mean things that are useful in high school. The Cartesian plane, an array, a whole part-part concept for fractions. Limit those and drive them well. According to the TMU, the balance of fluency, conceptual development, and problem solving, and that that comes through not in relation to part section C of the curriculum, which is week by week, this number range is in focus, but the big ideas mathematically. And so that we have not just progression in the size of numbers, but careful attention to number choice. So it's structuring in twos, fives, and tens, then hundreds and thousands, and why are you doing that? So the kind of idea, and I think you see that from many of the materials, is to design materials that are term by term, that have got a conceptual checkpoint midway through the year um, and at the end of the year that can be used, summative assessment used formatively um, to inform the next steps. There are also important things about the rhythm of a page. I think Arno's books do this really well, where you have every page, you know, you're going to do a bit of counting, a bit of calculating, a bit of problem solving. And the pattern of engagement becomes familiar. The kinds of representations are limited. So you're not running around teaching someone how does a number chain work, how does a function machine work, because they've experienced it from grade R all the way up, building that core representation. You also have a rhythm of a week. This is an example from the Magic Classroom Collective, very tightly defined and recognizing the conditions on the ground that there aren't actually 11 or 12 weeks in a year, there are eight. Uh, weeks in a term, there are only eight. And that you eight for teaching, that you have a game of the week that follows through the whole week, and then you have double-page spreads 
four of them, because you do need an opportunity to mop up. So you're getting a mini assessment and a practice page that allows for some people to be doing that and others to be revising. Um, and having some flexibility with regard to your use of time within a week as a teacher. We see the same kind of thing in the R maths intervention um, in terms of having uh, activities for a whole week, things that happen on four days and a mop-up day. Representations I've spoken about and the need for powerful ones, um, we need to be really clear about what are the representations that we're going for as South Africans. Here, this is from the Maths for Primary Teachers work, where we've argued that there are two big number meanings. One, the cardinal, which is set-based. The other, the ordinal, which is more number lines and measurement-based. It brings together measurement and number, together with fractions and creates a certain kind of coherence about what you're doing, as opposed to now we're doing time and then we're doing adding and now we're doing 276 to 278, right? You're trying to create a coherent picture across the materials. So those conceptual threads, which we argue need research and investment. We think there's been significant research into adding and subtracting of whole numbers, not even with fractional parts as solutions. And we have quite good coherence around what's needed there. But we don't have uh, conceptual threads around the rational number concept, around multiplicative reasoning, around how do we bring together measurement as a unit that gets repeated. This is an example of the kind of progression that we would expect in a concept guide. It comes from Kim's work as well as from Maths for Primary Teachers, saying when children are using counters and when they're using counters or drawings, you're expecting randomness, but you're quickly leading into a conceptual map of the hundredness, tenness, and oneness of numbers. Um, and that when you're entering into grade three, you're not saying take out the counters. You're certainly having a visual sense rather than going all the way back to grade R. We see in some of the materials, this is from Balawande, instructional prompts, the little red pencil, is the idea of let me show you one see the kind of thing that's done. And a little red pencil is used to signify a starting point, a pedagogical scaffold. We see some really interesting and creative ways in which teacher guides, which when they just print are not read, are now using videos and photographic evidence. We don't yet know how well that's being used and how it's landing, but there's innovation about trying to bring the pieces closer together. I'm going to give you an example of conceptual scaffolding. It is in a closer and it comes from the Magic Classroom Collective work. But this sits at the top of a page where the discourse that's needed to explain this example is given in the learner workbook. So Zibalo, who's a mathematician, she can say what it is that the teacher is saying, if you like, it's the teacher mantra for that lesson, to be repeating. If the teacher's just reading what Zibalo's saying, the lesson is going to uh, carry. And just to show the kind of space that takes up, that's the top third of a page, and then you're starting to work with things. So there's a deliberate pedagogical uh, support to teachers in the text. We then have, and I know I need to wrap up for Anna, we have two different language contexts. So for me, just at the level of one book, one child, one country, I go, okay, but there's multilingual urban and there's bilingual rural. And we have to be able to address that differently, and within that, there are 11 languages. So in multilingual environments, we have class language, and a class language, which is the language um, that most people are trying to understand or get inducted into, often English, and then diverse languages that the children bring into the classroom, often multiple languages. So the kinds of materials there need to have questions and prompts to encourage multiple language use. So you're not going, this is closer, this is English, but you're saying, how do you say this in your language? Let's get into groups of the same language, talk about this and present back to the class about how that works. So you're encouraging drawing out of the language resources of the children. So it's a far more heteroglossic orientation, and I know Lindiwe will talk about that, code switching, translanguaging, and trying to draw on all the available languages um, to make meaning in the classroom.
In the dominant uh, African language context, the resource is the African language. I'm going to use uh, Closer as an example. You come in with Closer, the teacher speaks Closer, and the text is in Closer, but increasingly shifting and supporting towards a Closer English bilingualism. So I just sketch out that urban and rural. I'm not going to cover the assessment, but assessment is a key part of that. It links into the core checkpoints. It links into using summative assessment formatively to be able to keep mopping up, revising, checking on where students are at. The conceptual thread, we feel like we've just touched the surface of looking at uh, division involving whole numbers from grade R to grade 6 across three um, sets of materials. We think that needs to be done in every conceptual thread. And to start to get that published, shared, thought through so that we have coherence within each of our uh, concepts from grade R to grade 6. Um, obviously, one of the key things in the international literature is no uh, LTSM works without teacher engagement, even it's, if it's at the level of use this for homework, um, it still gets mediated by the teacher and there's a great deal of need to support the teacher in that, which is why we think more has to go into the learner book to support the teacher. So my final um, slide is just the picture that I had. To me, that's the vision. We had originally thought about it as in different sectors, but for me, there's coordination that the DBE does around harnessing what's being done by the little yachts in order to keep the big ship stable. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to contribu contribute. And, uh, I hope I'm able to make a difference or make a contribution. I'd like to share this morning, I'd like to frame my remarks around what I think I know. And uh, I've been married for more than 30 years, so I know that I know very little, but I'm going to try. And uh, so let's start with that, which probably represents accurately what I think I know about learner materials. But in my sense, as we think about learner materials, we have to have a, a clear understanding of how mathematical concepts develop. If you're going to get into the business of developing materials, you have to have a clear understanding of that. I think you have to have an awareness of the developmental level of the child. You have to have a sense of what are you hoping, where are the children that you're hoping to support in their development. In their development. I think you have to have an appreciation of the dominant mental model of what it means to teach mathematics in the classrooms for which you're developing the materials. And finally, I think you have to recognize the regulatory context in which mathematics is taught. That's a word that I came up with. I don't know if it has, makes any sense, but it's the best I have been able to come up with for the purpose of this discussion. Teachers work in a context, and you have to be realistic about that. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to focus on one or two of these to begin with. And I'm going to begin with an understanding of the dominant mental model that teachers uh, have about what it means to teach mathematics. Now, I need to warn you, uh, let me introduce that idea by the fact that I turned 60 some hundred days ago. And to mark the occasion, the city of Cape Town sent me a letter they said, dear Mr. Brombacher, according to our records, you have about, you're about to or have just turned 60. We'd like to appraise you of the senior citizen benefits that the city has to offer. Well, to the city of Cape Town, I've got something to say, but let's leave that for now. But I'm about to abuse my senior citizen benefit of being allowed to be grumpy. So let's go into a typical classroom that I witness every day. And I'd like you to play along as the children in my classroom. And the lesson goes something like this. Good morning. What are we going to do today? We're going to do mathematics. What are we going to do? Mathematics. Correct. We're going to do mathematics. And in today's lesson, we're going to do fractions. What are we going to do? Fractions. What are we going to do? Fractions. What are we going to do? Fractions. Is she correct? Yes. Is she correct? What are we going to do? Fractions. Is he correct? Yes. Good. Notice how I alternated between boys and girls. <laughs> My children... A fraction is a numerical quantity that is not a whole number. 
A fraction represents the parts of a whole or collection of objects. A fraction has two parts, the number on the top, which is the numerator. It tells how many equal parts. And the number below the line is called the denominator. It shows the total number of equal parts the whole is divided into, or a total number of the same objects in the collection. My girl, what is the number above the line called? Is she correct? Yes, sir. Are you sure she's correct? Yes. Let's get a boy. What's the number above the line called, boy? Denominator. The denominator. Is he correct? No. Can we help him? Who can help him? I need a girl to help him. What is the number above? <laughs> and this is what happens in our classrooms day in and day out. You can't get away from it. In our interventions, we try to be innovative. We try to change the name from teacher to educator to facilitator. And everybody's able to, to assimilate that into what they do. The teacher says, I've always been a facilitator. I've always been an educator. And this is not new. We talk about learner-centered pedagogy. There isn't a teacher who would deny the importance of learner-centered pedagogy, and she will tell you that she's doing it. We talk about personalized learning, teaching at the developmental level of a child. Every teacher is doing that. We can name them pupils, learners, or students. It makes no difference to what happens in classrooms. Notice I'm abusing my senior citizen benefit. And we talk about equality and equity. We're not really sure what the two mean in respect to each other, but we do know what it means in terms of running the classroom because it means a boy, then a girl, then a boy, then a girl, then a boy, then a girl, so that the inspector can record that we, note that we asked as many questions to boys as we did to girls, even if the class has got 30 girls and 10 boys, we ask the same number to boys and girls. And so my rather cynical perception is that teaching is telling or chanting. And materials that support this need to rescue the child from their teacher. They need to be teacher-proof. There's a second comment is to say that I'm not giving up on teachers, but I'm asking that we develop teacher capability through the materials that we develop for the children. That's my hypothesis. I think we need to have an understanding how mathematical concepts are developed. And to talk to that, I want to draw on the work of Anna Swart, who makes the point that if you think about the collection, or if you think about, the, 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 if you think about numbers, they develop from concrete objects to real numbers. That's the kind of increasing circle if you wanted to draw it as a circle. The problem is that that picture misses out how these concepts have developed. Because what happens is we count objects, and the counting of objects brings into being the need for numbers. And so from counting, we get numbers. That's the purpose of counting. And so now we have the numbers. And then what we do is we measure with numbers. We divide with numbers. And now there is a need for something called a fraction. So the fraction is the result of division. It's the result of measuring. And that re gives rise to what we will call the positive rationals. When we work with the positive rationals and we do more measuring, and we have the theorem of Pythagoras that we need to find roots, we now introduce positive irrationals. And the, number, uh, the set of numbers increases to include the positive reals. And then we subtract, which brings to life negative numbers, and we now have the real number set. And what it says to me is that concepts can be known in two different ways. They can be known operationally or as a process, and then they can be known structurally or as an object. In other words, you can know five as the act of counting or coming to five, and eventually you can know five without having to think about the counting that gave meaning to it originally. And so you have this duality of, of, of understandings, and I think we need to be aware of that and play with that a lot more. And so to go for one more moment, in her work she talks about object A, and we want to get from object A to object B. And we get from object A to object B by working with object A, doing things with object A. That leads to what she calls interiorization. In other words, you become comfortable with that process on that object. That becomes condensed. You don't need to think about each of the steps as carefully anymore. And finally, big word, it becomes rarefied. And it now becomes an object in its own right. And if you think about the trajectory, the developmental trajectory of concepts, this is what I mean by you have to be aware of this journey. Because if we now want to develop concept C, then we need to begin that by working with concept B, by acting on concept B. 
And that was the heaviest part of my slideshow, I promise you. <laughs> but what it means in my mind in terms of implications for materials is that we must avoid introducing new ideas as ready-made. We must allow for regular practice. There's a push-pull relationship between reification and doing, and so we need to accept that a topic is never taught or dealt with and learned because it's been taught. It's on a, it's on a journey. And so what it says to me for materials is they, they must allow for a lot of regular practice, and they must be thoughtfully developed according to learning trajectories. We have to have a deep sense of those learning trajectories if we are to develop effective materials. And a, a, an awareness of the developmental level of the child. Let me invoke the mighty Vygotsky, who spoke about the zone of proximal development. And I don't need to tell you about that, but the idea is that within, within any class, you have children at different developmental levels. And if we don't support the children at their developmental level, then the children who are further ahead or not as far along the developmental journey lose out. The danger of it is that we begin to talk about strong children and weak children, and that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Whereas I prefer to use the language of children who are at different stages of the developmental journey, and if we can support them at their level of the developmental journey, they have a hope. If we don't have materials that can do that, we're in trouble. So I want to say that materials must allow for flexible uh, implementation informed by what we know about the children. And finally, there is a regulatory context in which mathematics is taught. There are these pace setters and whatever, and teachers need to comply. For example, here is a mighty pace setter for grade one. I'm going to be grumpy again for a moment. After nine weeks of mathematics, children are expected to compare the numbers one to five and say which is more and which is less. There are at most 13 possible combinations here that you could be presented with. It gets better because you have to practically solve word problems in a context, ex explain solutions to problems involving equal sharing and grouping with whole numbers to five that might include remainders. If you're bored, why don't you work out how many division problems there are in that number range? And only one of them doesn't have a remainder, two divided by two. If you want, put in one divided by one, and it's getting very rich. You now got two. And eventually, you have to do an addition and subtraction to five in a context-free, you call it bare, in a context-free situation. There are six of these sums. The density of garbage that is here is un unbelievable. I'm sorry, I have to be grumpy about this. Our children are better than this. Yes. And so what my challenge is, not that we must discount that, children, that teachers work in that environment, but I'm saying that we must provide a way that, that teachers can map what we ask them to do onto this context. In other words, they are doing sharing and grouping. They are doing this, they are doing that, but the number range in the materials might be a little bit more uh, curriculum agnostic. In Malawi, I'm going to talk more about that project now, at the last minute we had to develop a syllabus. So we developed a syllabus. It's a completely meaningless document in the sense that nobody will ever refer to it, but it meets the tick box. And so I think our challenge is to be responsive to the regulatory context. We mustn't poo-poo it entirely until we've had a chance to influence it and make it richer or stronger. But we do need to provide support to teachers so that they can feel that they are doing what's expected of them, but still be working in something that's more meaningful and valuable for the child. So what does all of this mean for foundation phase mathematics learning materials? I've tried to summarize it as we need materials that rescue the children from their teachers, but at the same time provide in-service or on-the-job training for those teachers, that allow for flexible implementation, that provide a lot of practice, that are designed according to developmental trajectories, and that are responsive to a context in which teachers work. So for the remainder of my minutes, I'd like to tell you my journey along the development of these material, of such materials. It began in Cape Town. It went to Jordan, where I was the technical lead on the reading and mathematics program, a $48 million USAID-funded program over four years. And 
is currently taking place in Malawi, the National Numeracy Program, and in both uh, Jordan and Malawi, these are curriculum replacement programs. So these are replacing the mathematics program of the country. In the case of the uh, South African experience, we developed the so-called Number Sense program. In the case of Jordan, we developed well, if you can read it, you can tell me what it says. It was quite fun working there because I knew what the, you know, I, I can read Arabic numerals these days. I can't read anything else. I have to trust the translators. And in Malawi, it's called the National Numeracy Program, and those are the materials. And you have copies of those in your, um, in your packet or in your uh, goodie bag, and those might give you a sense of what we're doing. If we have a look at those materials, the number sense materials have already been alluded to, then you'll notice that the materials we developed in Jordan look very similar. And the materials we've developed in Malawi also take some of those characteristic, uh, characteristics across. So what are those characteristics of those materials? The first is that they're teacher-proof in the sense that the pages are the same. They are familiar. Once you've done five pages, you've done the program. You know what's expected of you. You can do it independently. But they provide variety so that they use these different devices to create variety because the risk is that if you have 20 context-free calculations on a page, that becomes pretty boring pretty quickly. The pages provide a lot of practice. If you had to transcribe the calculations from a, workbook, a textbook or a blackboard or a chalkboard, you'd be able to do so many. So on some of these pages, children are doing 20, 30, 40 calculations and not aware of how many they're doing. They provide opportunity for implementation that's responsive to the developmental level of the child. That is, we envisage a possibility where children in the same class could be working on different pages of the same or different books. Now, just to be cautious here, we don't anticipate all 48 children being on a different page of a different book. We may imagine the children being clustered in two or three groups according to their developmental level. The pages are underpinned by a robust developmental journey or trajectory. I haven't the time to unpack that, but I can uh, attest to that. And the other thing, and Nikki's already mentioned this, is that each page is a unit. So we see the page as the unit. And within that page is an internal coherence that reveals the mathematics or the structure. Of course, it only does that if the challenge is age appropriate and there is a mechanism by which you're expected to notice or reflect. And that's where the role of the teacher comes in. And of course, all of the material is developed to develop knowledge with understanding, application and reasoning as uh, discussed in the book, Adding It Up. So what is the teacher's role? Because as much as I've been unkind about teachers, this can't be done without teachers. The teacher's role is as follows. I see the workbook page as materials that children will do independently at some point, either in small groups or alone during the lesson. But in order for that to happen, the teacher needs a teacher-led activity that introduces that page. And so, Nikki, it's not quite right that we say to the children, carry on. The teacher has a role to play in introducing what's going to happen on the page, not by telling children what to do on the page, but by doing a parallel activity. And in that sense, the workbook page is the lesson plan. If the teacher will do the page before the children do it, she thinks about the questions that she's going to ask, she thinks about the parallel problems that she's going to present, it forces her to have a deep understanding of that material and hopefully improve her own understanding of mathematics and how it's taught. And quite critically, throughout and as part of the lesson, there needs to be teacher-led reflection. The teacher, the children can't do this by themselves. The teacher is responsible for asking, how did you do that? What did you notice? Can you explain why it worked? Can you explain what she did? Somebody else explains, can you repeat in her words what she did? And so I see the workbook as having the potential of teacher development, and I think we got it right in Malawi, or we're getting it right, we're getting it right so we're doing better in Malawi than we did in Jordan and with the, new, uh, the Number Sense program, but we're going to update the Number Sense program in terms of these learnings. The learner workbook page is central to the activity, as I've already indicated, but what you'll notice at the bottom of the page is there is a puzzle piece, and that puzzle piece is actually the content area focus of that page. 
And if you then go to the teacher guide, you will find the corresponding puzzle piece in the teacher guide. That puzzle piece, with that puzzle piece, there is an overview of the content area. Why do we teach it? What's important about it? There is an illustrative page, and there is a discussion of the kind of teacher-led activity that might correspond to that page. And there is a discussion of the reflective questions that the teacher might ask. We're investigating making that more robust by probably having QR codes next to the puzzle piece. That's the next generation. Right now, that's what it looks like. And of course, well, not of course, but what we have is for every single puzzle piece a corresponding training video, an illustration of a teacher doing that in the classroom. There are 49 videos in the program at this stage. Um, yeah. That's our attempt at providing teacher professional development. Now, I know we're cynical about whether teachers read uh, teacher guides or not. Um, I'm reasonably optimistic in this particular way of doing it because I do believe that it provides teachers with a journey as opposed to um, something that's not directly linked to the page. The Malawi materials have been reviewed by two independent reviewers. I'm going to share what they've had to say about it, or extract from it. From the report by the Open University in the UK, they, they say, in summary, it's a coherent suite of resources, carefully planned to support increased expectations of learners in standards one to four. The materials are well presented, clearly articulated, and carefully considered to make a period of change manageable for both teachers and learners. From the Science of Teaching, a grant from the Belinda Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation managed or implemented by RTI in America. They write, the materials present strong support and guidance for effective teaching and learning mathematics in schools. We commend the quality of the pedagogical values and the presentation of the learning activities. The vision of the materials is original and the quality is obvious. The activities in the learner workbooks meet and in some instances exceed the standards of the global pressure proficiency framework. I think my time is up. I've probably overstayed my time by a few minutes. That's my experience of what it, what it does to develop uh, mathematics materials for the early grades. I hope it's contributed to discussion, and thank you very much.